I'm going to give you a tour of uh, OpenMP features which were added in, in version 4 or, or, or version 5. 4.5, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so just a little bit of, uh, of history here. So uh, OpenMP version 4 came out in July 2013, and you'll now find that available in most production version compilers, um, with the exception of the support for device offloading. Uh, so that's not in all compilers, uh, nor, nor available for all devices. The coverage there is a, bit, is a lot more patching. Um, I won't be talking about that part of it very much today, but I'll give you a flavor of it at the end. It really deserves a, uh, a whole topic or a, probably a whole, a whole course in itself. The most recent version is 4.5, which is coming on for two years old now. Uh, that mostly added additional enhancements to the offloading, the accelerator offloading capabilities, but there were a few other new features as well. Uh, and this is now in some production versions, but, but not, in, not in everything. Okay, so in terms of what we have available on Archer, so as of yesterday when I checked, the default versions of uh, compilers uh, so GNU compilers, Intel compilers, Cray compilers, all support 4.0. Uh, GNU and Intel claim to support 4.5, though Cray compiler does not. Though in practice, if you look at the, uh, at the man pages and release notes, uh, actually Cray do seem to be supporting most of what's in 4.5. Um, I would treat these claims with a little bit of caution. Um, when compilers say they support some, some feature or other, it, it, may, it probably means it does compile, your code will compile and execute, but it may not actually do anything interesting in terms of improving the performance. Um, so uh, there's one or two instances of that which I'll, which I'll mention as we go along. Okay, so what am I going to cover? So there's uh, basically half a dozen topics I'm going to talk through. So I'm not going to go into masses of detail. Um, but I'll give you a flavor of, uh, of what's in there and, uh, and some, some brief examples. So I'm going to talk about user-defined reductions, construct cancellation, the SIMD directives, uh, the extensions to tasking capabilities, uh, thread affinity, and then I'll finish up with a little bit about the accelerator offload support. So start off with user-defined reductions. So this has long been a complaint from uh, C++ programmers that uh, prior to 4.0, it wasn't possible to do reduction operations on anything other than basic types in, in, the, in the underlying language. So you can't do reduction operations on, on or you could not do reduction operations on objects or, or on structures. Um, but uh, but 4.0 added support for this. So the way this works is that you have a declare reduction directive to define new reduction operators, uh, and then those operators can then be used in the reduction clause uh, in, in, the, in the standard way. So you can define operators which you can then use. So instead of, you know, instead of every reduction clause, with, would uh, say say reduction uh, plus colon something. You can define your own operators to go in place of the plus. Um, so the way this works is that the the reduction uh, the declare reduction directive uh, takes some arguments. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at those what those mean. So the first argument is the identifier. So that just gives a name to the operator. Uh, you can overload that for different types, uh, and that can also be redefined in, in inner scopes as well. Uh, type name list, so that's a list of types to which it applies. Then you have a combiner expression, which tells the runtime library how to merge two values together. 
to, to give you the, the, the basic operation to, to form the reduction at the end. Uh, and then finally, it gives you have an identity. Uh, and so that allows you to specify the identity value for the operator. Um, so that can either be expression or, 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 or a brace, brace initializer. So that's important because what happens when you declare a variable as a reduction operator, every thread gets a new private copy of the data type and it's initialized to the identity. So we have to know what the, so we have to tell the runtime what we'd like in the identity value to be. So that gives us the initial value of the, of the private variable. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example, okay. Um, so I'm going to define a reduction operator which basically uh, merges two vectors together. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna call it, give it a name, call it merge. Uh, so it, it, uh, it applies to, to, to vectors of, of ints, okay. Uh, and then the way these, uh, the definition works, there are two special variables, okay? So there are, so there's, there's an input and there's, a, there's basically an input value and, and an output value. So you can, you can put two, basically, uh, when you merge two values together, you put something in, you combine it with, with the thing you've got and, and you get a value out. Um, so basically we can say, okay, uh, let's take the, the thing that the merged vector is by, is, is by doing an insert, uh, and do that from, so we add stuff at the, at the end of the output value, uh, and the thing we want to add starts at the beginning of the input value and the end of the output, uh, and the end of the input vector. Um, so that's our, that's our, that's our definition. Okay. Um, and I haven't specified an identifier. Um, there's a, there's a default one, uh, that's, uh, that appears. Okay. So in this case, it's good to vector. We just, uh, the, the, the identity is just a null vector. So we don't need to actually define an, uh, an, uh, the identity. So now we can use merge as a, as a reduction operator. Okay, uh, and and you just use it in a standard way. Okay, you can now specify. You can have a, uh, wherever you could have a reduction clause previously. You can now use use merge as a as a, as a reduction operator. Okay. So another thing that was missing that was uh, that came along in four point five is proper array reductions for for C and C plus plus. So uh, finally. Uh, after, a, after a long time, array and array sections in C++ are now permitted in reduction clauses. It wasn't formally the case. It's always been the case for Fortran, but, but not for C or C++. Uh, and this actually uh, relies on some array, array section syntax that was added in 4.0. Um, so OpenMP it defines its own way of defining array sections in, in C or C++. So you basically just give the array and then in square brackets, the, the lower bound colon the length. So we just have to remember that if you're translate, if you're skipping between Fortran and, uh, and C or, or C++, then this syntax is different, okay? So Fortran array, array section syntax is lower bound colon upper bound. Whereas this is lower bound colon length. So just something that might might trip you up at some point. So yeah, where should, okay, it's a question, where should the where should the reduction declaration uh, appear? Um, so it has to be ah, ah, I would have to look this up to give you the, the full details. Um, it has to appear in the programs in the scope uh, where, but before the reduction is used, for sure, yes. So uh, you can't be done in the same parallel region. 
uh, and the scoping is yeah I'm sorry I would need to I would need to look at the up the details that I don't have that uh, 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 on the top of my head, top of my head right now sorry about that Okay, uh, so the next topic was construct cancellation. Uh, so this is a clean way to signal early termination of an OpenMP construct. So the way this works is that while you're inside a parallel region, essentially one thread can raise a signal, uh, and then as soon as possible, other threads observe that signal and jump straight to the end of the construct. Uh, so this is this is useful if you're trying to do parallel searches, for example, and you just want to you just want everything to stop as soon as you've found the first instance of something in your search. Okay, um, so the directive for this is is cancel. Okay, uh, and then you have to specify what construct it is you're can you're cancelling. So you can cancel a parallel region. Uh, sections construct a parallel loop, so do in Fortran or four in, in, in C, C++, or task group. I'll talk about task, task group later. Okay. Uh, and then you can also define a cancellation point, which is a point at which threads will check to see whether the cancellation signal has been raised. So it's easy to see with the example, okay? So if I have a parallel region here, okay, and I go through a loop, and basically I'm just interested in, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a, have a loop where every iteration tests for something, but I just want to stop as soon as I've found the first one, okay? So as soon as, as, soon as testing, the, func the testing function uh, uh, returns true, I want the loop to terminate uh, and all threads to, to jump to the end, end of the loop. Okay. So in this case, the first thread for which the value Eureka is true will raise the signal, cancel the parallel region and exit. So the cancel directive itself is, a can is already a cancellation point. Um, so other threads will exit the next time they hit the cancel directive. So cancel also acts as a, as a, as a, as a uh, not only to raise the flag if it's true, but it also acts as a point where threads will check to see if the signal's been raised or not. If you want to do that in other places, then you can use the, uh, the, other, the cancellation point directive instead. So for example, if, you know, if, if, the, if the testing function took a long time, it self-contained loops, then you might want to add some additional cancellation points inside inside there so that you didn't have to wait for them to exit the testing function before they jumped out. So, uh, but on the other hand, there's, you know, there's going to be some overhead with, with executing the, the cancellation point itself. So you probably don't want too many of them. You don't, probably don't want to be doing it too often. So that's probably a little bit of tuning you're going to have to do um, to decide, decide, you know, what's the right frequency to to test for the test for the cancelling. So we'll move on and talk about these SIMD directives. So in the past, uh, and you know, and and they're still true. Many compilers support SIMD direct support their own set of SIMD directives to aid vectorization of, uh, of, of loops. And you know, compilers will do their best. Uh, if you just present it with a, a piece of code to, to, to vectorize it, um, but they can struggle sometimes without you as a programmer giving the compiler a bit more information. Okay, so hi Mike. Uh, so this is, how is cancel different from doing a reduction on private Eurekas to a global Eureka uh, and then if if global Eureka break? Um, it's it's a bit more flexible because you don't have to have, otherwise you'd have to be doing reductions fairly regularly inside your parallel loop. Um, and so in the instance that I gave you, you can't do that. 
Okay, there's no way to actually compute reductions halfway through a parallel loop. You have to wait till the end before you get the result. Um, so it's it's so it's actually quite tricky to do in 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 standard in standard OpenMP um, because you can't force that reduction to happen at, at whenever you like. And it also, I guess, it also avoids you know, a reduction would uh, is basically a, a, a barrier synchronization. So it avoids you having to to avoid you avoids you having lots of uh, barrier synchronization points in, inside your search or whatever. So otherwise, you have to everybody has to wait for everybody to show up at the reduction to happen. There's no way of doing it. Um, I mean, you can. It, it is part. It is perfectly possible to code this stuff yourself. Right? You can do. Uh, you you know you can create some shared variable that you would do. Uh, you can do it with locks and uh, you know some you can raise a flag, um, but then you have to make sure that you also you put all the control flow in place to jump to the right to jump to the right place. Uh, that's not always straightforward. If you're uh, if if it's inline code, that's okay. But if you're somewhere deep inside a call tree. Then, 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 then organizing the jump all the way back up the call tree to exit the parallel region is is, is possible, but it's 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 unpleasant. So it's uh, it's largely a convenience. It's largely a convenience thing. Okay, good. Yes. So um, compilers provide their own SIMD directives. Um, but they're not standardized. They are, you know, every compiler has its own has its own flavor. So OpenMP4 provides a standardized set uh, of these directives. So the, the the basic one is the simply directive to indicate that the loop should be should be simplyized. Okay, so that that says execute iterations of the following loop in simd chunks. Okay. Uh, and the loop, but this does not Divide the loop across across threads. Okay, so uh, a SIMD chunk is just just a set of iterations which are executed currently uh, by 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 multiple SIMD lanes. So there are various clauses on the SIMD directive to control uh, the data environment and how the loop's partitioned. Um, so there is a you can say safe len of a length, which puts an upper bound on the number of iterations in a SIMD chunk. Uh, the linear clause lists variables with a linear relationship to the to the iteration space. Okay, so if you have a uh, if you have a temporary variable which is incremented by a constant every time you go around the loop, then formally that's a that's a dependency. So every iteration depends on the previous one. Um, so you may need to tell the compiler that, uh, that that's what's going on, so that it, it can uh, it can break that dependency and generate the right vectorized code. Uh, possibly the most important one is aligned to specify the byte alignments of, of variables. So this is this is one of the main reasons why compilers have a tough time vectorizing code. Uh, without any assistance, uh, is that in general it's often hard for the compiler to know at compile time what the what the byte alignment is of your of variables, you know, so whether they're aligned on a on a, a, a double or quad word boundary or not. Um, so, for example, you know, any any variables that get passed in through the argument list, um, Essentially, the compiler has no idea what their alignment is, and it could be different to, for different calls of that function. So you can also have private and reduction variables here um, in in SIMD loops. Uh, so they have their usual, they have their essentially their usual meanings, same as in parallel loops. Uh, and you can also use the collapse clause. So the collapse clause uh, formally applied just to parallel loops to say, okay, if you've got a perfectly nested loop, then merge the merge the loops in the loop nest uh, and form one long loop and then parallelize that. 
So you can also do that with uh, with vector loops. So you actually merge the the loops in a nest uh, and and vectorize the resulting long loop that comes out. Of You can also have a, there's also a declare SIMD directive which uh, allows you to generate SIMDized versions of functions. Okay, so it only applies to certain types of, certain types of functions which are essentially, um, essentially pure. Hi Fiona, so, so the SIMD direction doesn't split the work across threads, that's true, yes. So yes, if you want to use multiple threads, you need to. You still need a parallel region, and you still need uh, you still need a for or do as as normal. Okay. So yeah, that's my little example at the bottom of the slide here. Okay. So you can you can do everything in one construct. So you can say uh, you can say you know if you want to want to uh, parallelize and sim and vectorize your loop, then you can say something like hash hash pragma omp parallel for simd. Uh, and that will do both. Okay, but you there might be instances where that's not what you want to do. So if you have a, a loop nest, then you might want to parallelize the outer loop across threads, uh, and then vectorize the innermost loop over, over your SIMD lanes. So it gives you full flexibility as to as to which loops you, know, you can decouple these. You, know, you can you can you can either have them you know, a loop that is parallelized and, and vectorized, or you can do it separately. So it gives you kind of full flexibility. So the declare SIMD directives will allows you to uh, generate these uh, vector versions of functions. Um, so it's, uh, it only works for certain types of functions. So essentially side effect, they have to be like basically side effect free functions that, uh, that, um, that you, can, you can do this with. So the important thing to realize about the SIMD, uh, before I move on, the important thing for our SIMD is it, it, it is actually a, it is actually a do this directive rather than a rather than a hint. Okay. So if you if you put SIMD directives on on loops with dependencies in them, okay, so loops which are not parallel, not safe to parallelize, then you can get garbage out. Okay. And if you if you have a reduction variable in there and you don't don't declare it as a reduction variable, you can also get garbage out. Okay, so it's not a it's not a hint to the compiler to say uh, please vectorize that. It's you know it's very much in the spirit of the rest of the OpenMP, which says really this is a you know this is this is an order and and, and not a hint. Uh, and so it's up it's up to the programmer to make sure that you're really really doing the right. So the next topic is some of the extensions. Yes, yeah, the data scoping is important. You've got to get your um, your private variable, private private reduction variables right. So it's uh, it's the it's the same deal. If you don't if you don't declare those correctly, then you can you can be uh, um, you can be badly. Uh, it, it just it, it it will generate wrong answers. Okay, yeah. So I don't know how many of you have ever used tasks in OpenMP. Um, uh, they're not that widely used, I, I, I don't think. Um, but, the, but OpenMP 4 and 4.5 added some, some additional features. Uh, and the first of these is basically a, the task group directive. So this is a way to allow a task to wait for all descendant tasks to complete. Okay, so in, uh, OpenMP tasks can be nested, so task a you know task construct may itself contain task constructs and, and so on. So you can have recursively generated tasks. So task group allows you know if you if you have recursively generated tasks, then the task will wait for all its descendant tasks to the way to wait for all descendant tasks to complete. Okay, so this is different from task wait. So task wait only waits for immediate children uh, and not for grandchildren or great grandchildren or anything further down the further down the recursion, recursion tree or further down the nesting. Okay. Uh, and it's different. So, it, so unlike task wait, which is just a standalone directive, task group has an associated structured block. Okay. 
So if you say hash private OMP task group, then essentially you everything inside there, all tasks that are generated inside that structured block are guaranteed to be complete before the block exits, before you before you exit the before you go past the uh, the closed curly brace there. You're guaranteed that any task that was generated inside that block of code has finished by that point. So it's a it's a deep weight as a, as opposed to a shallow weight in the in the task tree. I think the intention was that should always be there, but it, it just didn't make it into into the uh, into version three or three point one. Nobody could quite agree how to do it properly. Um, so there we go. So an a really interesting thing that was that was added in in four point zero is task dependencies. Uh, and the way this works is that you can put a depend clause on the on the task construct. Okay, um, so you can say OMP task depend, uh, and then you have a, a type which is either in or out, uh, and then a list of variables. Okay, uh, and this list may contain subarrays. Okay, and this is another place where the where the, uh, the subarray syntax for C and C++ can be used here. So basically, in says this is an input dependence. So that means that this task is going to this task is going to read from that from that piece of data. Okay, so it, it needs to execute after anything uh, that, that that's going to write that piece of data. So in says the generated task will be a dependent task of all previously generated sibling tasks that reference at least one of the list items in an out clause. Okay, so that means that if any of, if any of those variables uh, have previously appeared in an out clause for a task at this level of nesting, okay, that's what sibling means, it's just restricted to, to the current level of nesting, okay, then, then this task will, will wait for those tasks to complete. Okay. Uh, and then out basically says this is an output. Uh, so this task is essentially this means that uh, this is a way of signaling this task is going to write this variable. So that will be a dependent of all previously generated sibling tasks uh, that have that references either an in or an out clause. Okay. Uh, so that has to be has it has to uh, depend on ins as well. Otherwise, you get a uh, you can get a, a read before write problem. Uh, the type also supports in out. That's for clarity. Okay, so you can say this. Okay, this uh, this variable is going to be read and written, um, but the semantics are just the same as out. Okay, so semantically, it's no different. It's just a syntactic convenience which uh, helps you indicate uh, in, in the code what the dependency, what the real dependencies are. So here's a very simple example. So I can have th three tasks here. Uh, so I said the first task has an output dependency on A, the second one an output on B, and then the third task has an input dependency on, on A and B. So what this means is that those first two tasks can execute in parallel, but the third task cannot start until the first two are complete. So the first task, basically, the first task is going to write A, second task is going to write B, uh, and then the third one needs to read those three values for both A and B. That's a very simple example, but actually this concept is really pretty powerful. Um, so what it what it does is actually gives a way of doing the sort of asynchronous many task style of programming that uh, you know that you'll find in uh, task based runtimes like OpenSS or uh, the sort of linear algebra libraries based on uh, based on asynchronous tasks like Plasma, Plasma, or Deep Plasma. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So this basically allows you to, you know, allows you to do a very different style of programming altogether. So essentially, what you're doing as a programming is you're just specifying the computational tasks and the data dependencies between them, uh, and then you're handing all responsibility for their execution order over to the OpenMP runtime. 
So uh, the, the execution order is undetermined uh, up to the, the respecting of the dependencies. So the runtime can do anything it likes with the ordering as long as it, as long as it, the, uh, the the dependencies are respected. Okay, this is actually really this is actually really interesting because it can help avoid some of the scalabilities you get with problems with uh, with bulk synchronous approaches. And so, uh, so typically most uh, most OpenMP programs are full of barrier synchronization. Okay. <laughs> Um, so you know every every the end of end of every parallel loop in OpenMP is is a barrier uh, unless you tell it otherwise. And so uh, by you know, the way that sort of standard parallel regions and parallel loops work in OpenMP is that they very much force this kind of bulk synchronous approach. Okay, every thread does something, then they all synchronize. Then every th every thread does something else, and they all synchronize again. Okay? Um, so, and there's no there's no mechanism in uh, in OpenMP otherwise to do um, point to point synchronization between threads. Um, you can do it if you're really really careful and know what you're doing with um, atomics and, and flushes and so on. It is possible to code it yourself, but there's really no way to, for uh, there's no good clean way uh, otherwise for you know, to be able to say in OpenMP, okay, I want this thread now to wait for a particular thread to trigger some event. Okay. Um, but task dependencies are essentially a way of doing this. Um, it doesn't give you full flexibility, but it's, um, but it's pretty interesting in that respect. It allows you to to write code that, that really has these point-to-point -point dependencies and, and avoid having lots of barriers with the every time you have a barrier there's always a risk that you have some load imbalance because all the threads don't get there at the same time and barriers are quite expensive anyway. Uh, and another tasking feature that came in in 4.5 is the task loop construct. So this basically just allows you to automatically generate tasks from a parallel loop without having to do so hand-coded blocking of the loop. Okay. So it's, it's again, it's really just syntactic convenience. It doesn't add any sort of fundamental functionality, um, but it's, uh, it just makes it, which makes writing code a bit easier. So essentially you can use this wherever you would use a standard parallel loop directive uh, uh, and instead of breaking it down into uh, into iteration chunks it, it actually really generates tasks here um, what's the difference well if you have if all threads are uh, essentially if all threads are participating in a parallel region then they all have to uh, encounter the a standard or or do directive Whereas with a task loop, you can, it's more flexible. You can have one thread that, that generates the tasks and the other threads can, can pick them up uh, and also be executing other tasks, uh, executing other code, um, waiting for tasks to appear. So, so it gives a, a, a lot of more flexibility and it's uh, kind of useful in cases where you have nested parallelism, but you but things are very badly balanced. So you get uh, because of the sort of the way that tasks work allows essentially any thread to steal any task from any other thread. Uh, then it helps to to balance out the load in these kind kind of cases. So with a task loop directive, you can either choose the number of tasks you want to break the loop into or you can choose the number of iterations per task. You can, you can do it either way. Uh, uh, and there's an, there is an implicit synchronization at the end of the loop, so it behaves as though it was enclosed in a task group construct. So all tasks inside this loop and nested inside tasks inside this loop are guaranteed to be complete by the time you get to the end, but you can suppress that if you want. Okay, so you can get rid of that. Uh, that synchronization point if you want, but it's there by default. 
threat affinity. Okay, so uh, now these days we're dealing with systems, so a lot of the time they have uh, NUMA nodes. So uh, you know you have multiple sockets in a node, and you also have S uh, simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading, as, as Intel likes to call it. So you know, this means that you know the, the where you place your threads on your hardware can have a big effect on performance. Okay. Uh, so up until now, as in prior to 4.0, control, you know, uh, there wasn't much control of that in, in, in OpenMP. So and some compilers had their own extensions for doing this. And particularly Intel compiler had, had this sort of KMP affinity um, directives and calls to, to allow you to do this. So essentially, something like KMP is not exactly, it's not the same as KMP affinity, but you know, something similar has now been standardized in OpenMP to give you much more control. Um, don't expect this to be useful on machines like Archer. So on Archer, uh, essentially, whenever you're, if you're, whenever you're running a batch job, you're, you're launching OpenMP inside uh, an AP, the AP run command. The AP run command is actually taking care of the uh, the thread binding and affinity for you, uh, and most of the time it does it does what you want. Um, so the only case where I can think this might be useful is if you have nested parallel regions, okay, and that's uh, that's not really common. So you know, most Archer applications, if they do use OpenMP, then they're using uh, MPI and then just plain old one level, single level open, open MP inside. Um, if you do use nested parallel regions, then you might care. Okay, you might say, well, actually, for the inner parallel regions, I would like all my th all the threads for this parallel, this inner parallel region to be on the same on the same socket, or maybe I want to make sure that they're not executing on the set on hyper threads on the same core. Or, or that kind of thing. Uh, and so you have some control about doing that. Okay. So the way this works is that you have you now have uh, you have more choices for the OMP proc bind environment variable. Um, so previously you could just say true or false, okay, which would say to the runtime, yes, please bind my threads to cores or hyper threads or whatever, or please don't. Um, but now you can provide uh, a list, okay, uh, with some possible values. It can be it can be master, close, or spread uh, to specify how to bind parallel regions at different nesting levels. Uh, and then you can also uh, you also have a way of describing your hardware as well. So this is done through the OMP places environment variable. Um, so you can specify abstract names. So things like threads, cores, sockets. So those things are, are implementation defined, um, but you know, a sensible implementation will, will give you some uh, give you some sensible names to use here. Uh, and you can also specify an explicit ordered list of places. Okay. So again, the place numbering is implementation defined, but so it allows you to number. Uh, you know, allows you to say, okay. I, you know, I want this parallel region to execute on precisely this set of cores, and I'm going to give you the core numbers that I, that I want you to run it on. Okay, so let's suppose we have, I'll try to give you an example here. Okay, so let's suppose we have a, a processor which has eight cores, uh, and each core has four hardware threads. Okay. Uh, and suppose I am running a, um, a nested program, okay, so a nested OpenMP program, so I've got two levels of parallelism. So I've got an outer level, uh, and then each thread in the outer level uh, is also going to, um, okay. So Fer is asking, how, does, how, why is it, how is it different from KMP affinity? It's it does the same job, but the syntax and semantics are a bit different. Okay, it's intended to solve the same problem, but it's not a direct implementation of what's in what's in the Intel compiler. 
it basically tries tries to give you the same sort of the same sort of control, but it's uh, as as with most things in, in in OpenMP, they've been very reluctant just to adopt a single vendor's implementation wholesale. We've always done something that's a, a little bit different, and uh, yeah, and that is, yeah, yeah, there has to be some consensus between different vendors as to what they're going to support. So here you might say, okay. Um, do the binding, then you can say uh, export OMP places equals threads. So that means basically the you know the, the 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 hardware units that I'm talking about here are hardware threads. Okay, uh, and then you can say OMP proc bind equals spread comma close. Okay, so what that will do is for the outer level parallel region it will spread the OpenMP threads out as far as possible. Okay, so suppose, and so in the, in the picture here, I'm just going to suppose that there are four OpenMP threads in the outer parallel region. Okay, so they will get, they will get spread out as much as possible. So I'll get one on cores, one on core zero, one on core two, one on core four, uh, and one on core six. Uh, and then I suppose that, that, uh, that there are now also, each of those four threads is going to spawn another parallel region with four threads. So I'm gonna end up with 16 open MP threads running. Okay. Uh, and then they will, that will say, okay, um, put those close together, okay, at the second level. So what that will end up with is that I will get, say, on, uh, so if we look at the thread that's running on core two, that's going to spawn three additional threads, okay? Two of those will run on core two, and two of those will run on core, on, on core three. If I'd said, if instead of spread close here, if I said spread master, then, all those four threads, I would then have four threads running on core two and not on core three. So the, the, the meaning of these things is a little bit, is I find slightly odd and slightly hard to get your head around. Um, they, are, they are reasonably well defined in, in the specification, um, but essentially allows you to do this, to, 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 you know, to create the, these patterns of, of uh, of placement. So, in addition, you can also put put uh, you know put lists of you know, so you could you know there's a way of saying okay if I actually want everything if I really want to restrict everything to running on the on on the first uh, uh, on the first four cores here then you know I can explicitly put put a list of you know, cores zero to three in in there and uh, and, and that will restrict it and make everything run on on those on those four cores. So you can do all that. So potentially useful on on systems which where the where the batch system doesn't offer you this sort of control. They are, are on Archer largely speaking, you don't need to do this because uh, it, it's all done through uh, through AP runs. Good. So we'll finish up saying a little bit about the accelerator support. Uh, this is really a big topic. Um, you know, it's pretty much a, a whole new programming language in itself that's embedded inside OpenMP and you know, the, a full treatment would, would deserve a full course, um, which I think we are planning to run such a thing at some point in the future, maybe next year sometime. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to run a, try and run a open, an, an OpenMP accelerator directives course. So the support in OpenMP is similar to, but not the same as the OpenACC directives. Okay. Uh, there's, some, there's some political history here. Okay, so uh, OpenACC kind of took some of the stuff that was being discussed in, in the OpenMP forum, uh, in, in the OpenMP language committee, uh, they ran away uh, and did their own thing, produced their own independent specification. Um, but now, as we'll see, it, it's kind of merged back together in, in some sense. Okay. 
Um, it's different from OpenACC in that it has support for more than just loops. Uh, and it doesn't rely on the compiler to parallelize and map code to threads. Okay. So, um, which, which OpenACC does in, in some cases. Uh, OpenMP support is not GPU specific. Um, it does work for GPUs, but it was also intended to work for other accelerator devices, um, of which the useful list is approximately zero right now, I think. Um, except possibly some uh, some DSP chips. So Texas Instruments have their have an OpenMP compiler for their for some of their DSP chips, and I think they are using this uh, this to do offloading onto those. Uh, so that's kind of a bit specialized. Um, so I think you know originally it was designed with you know with. Uh, Things like uh, Intel Xeon Phi's in mind, but currently, uh, current generation of Xeon Phi's are not being sold very much, as far as I know, as attached accelerated devices. They're just being sold as direct CPU replacements, uh, and you just run standard OpenMP on them, and you don't need to do any offloading. So the supporting OpenMP is fully integrated into the rest of OpenMP. Okay, so it all makes sense with respect to uh, you know OpenMP running on the host as well as on the as well as having stuff offloaded onto the device as well. So it's clear, you know, it, it, it's clear what happens if you have multiple threads all trying to offload or, or you know it's uh, uh, all the, the behavior is is well defined in that respect. So you know it, it meshes properly with rest of OpenMP. Uh, unfortunately, it's not relevant for Archer because we don't have any accelerated devices on it, but uh, who knows what we what we might end up with in, in, in future systems. Uh, and it's, you know, it's interesting if you've got access to a, to a GPU-based system. Okay, so how does it work? Well, it's basically a host-centric model, so it assumes that you have one host device uh, and then you have multiple target devices of the same type. Okay, so it doesn't support really heter uh, really heterogeneous systems where you might have lot you might have multiple different accelerators attached in the node. So there has to be a sort of definition of a whole bunch of new terms here to cope with to cope with this uh, with this expanded view of uh, abstract view of the architecture. So basically, in, in OpenMP, you now have this concept of a device, which is a logical execution engine with some local storage. Uh, and you also have a device data environment. So that's the, a, a data environment associated with, with a target data or, or, or target region. Okay. Uh, and then we have a target construct, uh, or there's several target constructs which control how both data and code it is offloaded to a device. Okay. So data is basically mapped from the host data environment into the device data environment. So, uh, you know, so they're, you know, they're explicitly separate memory spaces, uh, which reflects the, the reality of the underlying hardware. So the GPU has its own memory, for example. That's, uh, that's reflected in the in the in OpenMP's acting, OpenMP's model of worlds. Okay. So essentially, the way this works is that uh, the code inside the target region is is executed on the device. Okay. So pretty straightforward. Um, but that executes sequentially by default. So how do you get parallelism on the device? Well, the answer is you use standard OpenMP directives, more or less, to run in parallel on, on, the, on, on, on the device. Okay? Now, I say more or less here because there's a certain amount of, of, of ambiguity between different implementations here, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on uh, again in, in, in a minute. Um, but the basic idea here is you can say, OK, Suppose I have this. Uh, suppose I have a, a loop which uh, you know which basically forms the, uh, the the sum of two vectors and and, and does a reduction to this sum variable. Okay. 
So I can say, you know, so I can say, okay, let's offload this onto, onto a device. So I say hash pro private OMP target, that's going to offload it. Uh, and then I have to say, okay, what do I want to do with the data? Okay, so I say map to BNC. So that means that the arrays BNC will be copied from the host onto the device before the loop starts executing. The variables have the same name on the host and on the device, but you've now got to get your head around the fact that there are separate instances of these things uh, and they are not kept coherent except by the directives. And then for the sum variable, okay, I say map to fro from sum. So that means the value, the initial value of sum will be copied onto the device to begin with. And then when the target region is finished executing, the final value will be, will be copied back again. So then I want to do, I don't actually want to do the computation in parallel on the device. So I just do that in the regular old way, okay? So I can just say mesh private OMP parallel before reduction sum. Okay, just in, a, in, the, in the standard way that I would normally parallelize that. Okay. So that now, so the target specifies offload to the device, uh, specifies what data needs to be moved at what point, uh, and then I just use regular OpenMP to specify how I'd like it parallelized on the device. So other things we have, we have okay, we have a target data construct, okay. So that's, that's like a target construct, except that it doesn't execute anything. All it does is move data. Typically what you find, especially with, uh, with these attached devices, that there's a lot of overhead in moving data on and off the, the, the device. Um, so you want to keep that to a minimum. So it makes sense to have your data movement at, an, at the outermost level as possible uh, and not to have and try to minimize the amount of copying that goes on. So you, you know, you basically, you don't want to be copying data for every parallel loop if you can avoid it. If you can say copy stuff once at the, at the start of the program uh, and once off at the end, then, then that's going to be much better. You can also do unstructured updates as well. You can do an inside, once you're inside a target data uh, region, then you can do updates in either direction at any point you like. You can say, okay, at this point, I want the I want to copy from the host of the device, and then later on at some other point I want to do the, the copy the other way. That allows you sort of full freedom to do uh, to do data movement in either direction whenever you want. It doesn't have to be associated with um, the kernel that's been that's been offloaded. OpenMP allows you to call functions or subroutines on the device, uh, but you have to so you have to use a declare target. Uh, directive to to tell the compiler that it needs to build a uh, uh, a version of this function this routine for the, the device as well. So this is something. This the next thing is something that's changed between four and four point five. Okay, so originally in version four, target regions were blocking by default. Okay, so the the thread that encountered the target region on the host would by default wait for that region to complete. Okay. Uh, and then if you wanted asynchronous behavior, if you wanted to say, okay, actually I want that where while that, uh, while that kernel is getting executed on, on the device, I want that thread on the host to go away and do other stuff, then you would achieve that by wrapping it inside a task. Okay. Uh, and the task with dependencies if you wanted to. Okay. Um, this is now different. Okay. Uh, in Obey 4.5, you can now use no wait clean clause on the target. Okay. So you have a way of doing, you can, uh, you don't have, if you want the asynchronous behavior, you can do it without using tasks. So you can say, okay, say so target no wait, uh, uh, and then you have some guarantees about when things are, when things are complete later. Okay, so. Next time you come, next time the thread synchronizes in Barra, you'll know that, that all, of, all the target regions that it's supported have been completed. So that all sounds great, but actually this doesn't quite work on GPUs because um, 
executing a target region on a GPU, you can only use one of the multiprocessors on a GPU, okay? Uh, because um, uh, GPUs don't support all the synchronization mechanisms for, for, the, for the whole of OpenMP. Okay? Um, so you can't synchronize, you can't in general synchronize uh, threads on a GPU that are executing on different multiprocessors. Um, so in practice, that's not much use. Uh, so in order to get uh, something that actually, actually works uh, on GPUs, then there's also some additional stuff in there which is sort of restricted forms of parallelism uh, that basically you know, that basically spawn threads and distribute loop iterations, um, but do it in a in a in a restrictive way that doesn't require any uh, any of the synchronization support. So we've got a Teams construct which essentially creates multiple master threads which can execute in parallel. Okay. Uh, and those master threads can also spawn parallel regions, but they can't synchronize or communicate with each other. Uh, and then you also have a distribute construct which spreads the iterations of a parallel loop across teams. But again, because there's no synchronization possible between the teams, the only schedule option you get is, is static, okay, or static with a chunk size. So essentially, you have to have a predetermined loop schedule. You can't do dynamic loop schedule, loop scheduling in this kind of way because you, you don't have the underlying synchronization support. So if I want to use the same example that I had before, if I want to do this on a GPU, then I basically need uh, you know, I need a directive as long as my arm to do it with, uh, and you can compress it all into one directive. So you can have this ridiculous thing that says. Hash prime for OMP target teams distribute parallel four. Okay, uh, and then the data mapping and, and reduction clauses on the end of that. Okay, so that will not only distribute the iteration, iterations across multiprocessors, it will also distribute the iterations across threads within each multiprocessor. So that gets what you want on the GPU. So that allows you to exploit all the threads all the hardware threads, all the cores on, on a GPU to, uh, to execute that, that loop in parallel uh, and, and get the result back onto the, onto the host and back to the host. So I kind of hinted before there's some sort of ambiguity here. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you can also throw SIMD into the mix here. Right? So it's also possible to, uh, to put a SIMD directive on there as well. Uh, um, but it's for GPUs. It's really it's not really clear, and different implementations have taken different points of view here. So you know, is the parallelism in between uh, between the cores inside a single multiprocessor on a GPU? Is that SIMD parallelism, or is that threaded parallelism? Okay. Uh, and the OpenMP specification isn't really clear about that, uh, and different implementations, different vendors have unfortunately taken a bit of a different point of view here. So the Cray compiler basically treats that as SIMD parallelism. Okay. So uh, uh, the, for the Cray compiler, a parallel region on a GPU device always executes on one thread. Uh, and it only supports, it basically does automatic vectorization to exploit the cores inside a multiprocessor. Um, other implementations have taken the other point of view. Um, so that's kind of a bit confusing. So it seems that, you know, although Yes, this does give you a standardized way of doing the offloading. Um, there may be, you know, performance portability may not be that good. You may have to write your code slightly differently depending on which compiler you're using uh, and what the, the target device is. So that, that's a little bit unfortunate. 
But nevertheless, okay, so what's the difference between, between this and OpenACC? Okay? So essentially, the latest versions of OpenMP, so i.e. OpenMP 4.5 and OpenACC 2.5, support pretty much the same functionality, but with different syntax. Okay, and that was, that was a conscious decision between the two specification bodies to try and converge the functionality of, of the two APIs. Okay, they didn't, didn't attempt to converge the syntax but they did try to converge the functionality. So everything, pretty much everything you can do in one, you can do in another with, with a different syntax. The only exception here is the OpenACC kernels directive, okay? Because that really does rely completely on compiler auto parallelization. That basically says, right, just here's a chunk of code, off you go, you know, compiler, figure out all the, you know, where the parallelism is and how to map this onto the device and everything, okay? That's completely, you know, total auto parallelization effectively. Um, uh, and that sort of goes against the, the sort of the prescriptive philosophy of OpenMP. So OpenMP has always been designed, designed in a way that, that is, that, uh, you know, you as a programmer are telling the, com telling the compiler what to do and the compiler doesn't need to implement any, any sort of auto parallelization intelligence in order to have a, a, a fully functioning OpenMP uh, implementation. So, you know, so OpenACC is now not likely to evolve any, any further, okay? It's probably not going to die off very quickly. There's a bunch of code out there which will continue, you know, and uh, kind of these, uh, the compilers that support OpenACC will probably continue to do so for, for, for some time. Um, but now if you, you know, but if you're, if you're thinking about you know, doing this kind of programming now, then it's probably worth considering using OpenMP 4.5 specification for uh, you know for portability, uh, modular what I said about slightly different interpretations of the standard uh, and, and sustainability. Right? And the, the open ACC stuff may you know may start to die off eventually, and it certainly isn't going to it almost certainly isn't going to spread to any any other implementations. I'd be surprised to see any any compilers you know, taking up. Open ACC that, that, that already have it. Okay, so um, sorry, I've overrun the hour a little bit. Um, that's all I was going to say. So, are there are there any uh, any final questions at the end? Ah, good question. Using declared reductions in Fortran at the moment. Um, who is anybody actually using? I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm. I've not. I've never seen it. I haven't seen it done in Fortran code. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that people out there aren't doing it. Yes, quite. Okay. So the you know that's sort of what I was hinting at is you have to be a little bit careful with you know uh, vendors' claims about what what they support and what they don't support. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, that, that is really a bit naughty. They shouldn't do that. Hope that was useful. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>